This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to receive 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hello and welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Charles Hoskinson and Alexander Chepurnoy, who are part of the company Input Output Hong Kong, IOHK. We'll be talking about the company IOHK, one of their projects called Scorex. And uh, since Charles Hoskinson is now supporting it, Ethereum Classic, we'll be trying to get a feel about what are the opportunities and challenges in front of Ethereum Classic. So before we begin, let's have an introduction from both Charles and Alex, starting with Charles. So Charles, tell us a bit about your background. Hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Input Output. Uh, we're a service and a research company. Uh, my background is in mathematics. I studied analytic number theory a long time ago, briefly had a foray into cryptography, and then somewhere along that sojourn, I decided to go into the cryptocurrency space. I've started three companies, Invictus Innovations. I helped start Ethereum, and uh, now I have Input Output. And Alex, a bit about your background. I'm a developer uh, with an unfinished PhD, and uh, I'm writing computer programs since 12, so for right 20 years now. And uh, I used to be an XT core developer, and uh, I uh, also was a co-founder of smartcontract.com, and uh, now I'm working on Scorex in IHK research. Cool. So let, let's start with IOHK. So what does the company exactly do, Charles? Well, after um, doing BitShares and doing Ethereum, I, I really wanted to start a company that wasn't a project, but more of a, an actual company. You see, the, the, the prior efforts were all about, let's build a team of people and let's go raise some money and go build something and release it, an open source protocol. And I said, it would be a lot of fun to actually do that full time. So actually, let's create a company that's like a factory for cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency technology. Um, the challenge behind running a company like that is, is not just development. There turns out that on the academic side of things, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty on whether things are secure or how certain technology is actually supposed to work. So we set up both a service and a research company together. So on the research side, we have a very diverse, large team of uh, researchers. A lot have PhDs in cryptography. A lot are very skilled developers like Alex and others. Uh, and uh, basically that side of the organization focuses on first principles research. So we do everything from develop new consensus algorithms to study new anonymity schemes to worrying about secure multi-party computation. Uh, we also have actually a dedicated center within our research team that worries about governance. And basically how do you govern an open source project? On the service side, we build cryptocurrencies for clients. And this can be everything from something deployed on top of a chain, so like an overlay protocol or an app coin, uh, to a full stack cryptocurrency. And we can set up everything. We can kind of consult on how a crowd sale should look, um, talk about the long-term governance model, uh, and also what the code needs to look like. Um, on the service side, everything we do is functional. So we're a Haskell shop. Uh, but we also like Erlang, and we found Cloud Haskell not too long ago. So uh, now we don't even have to choose between the two. We use Cloud Haskell and uh, Haskell together. Uh, and we also really love formalisms. So we're big fans of things like Isabel and Koch and uh, other formal methods to actually prove that the code being written is correct. Very interesting. And, and so with your service projects, you mentioned specifically cryptocurrencies. Uh, do you guys also build uh, blockchain systems for, for non-currency purposes? You know, we could, and we've actually explored uh, a lot of different ideas from cloud funding uh, platforms to ways to incentivize certain things. For example, we're really interested in incentives for network relay. So we've had some conversations there. Um, then there's also incentivizing behavior, like how do you incentivize voting and participation in a system? That's an open topic, and it's something we think a lot about. Um, you know, there's a lot of practical problems that would be really nice to solve, like continuous real-time auditing using triple entry accounting. Um, we're also really uh, curious about what a central bank cryptocurrency should look like. There was a recent project that UCL and Bank of England did called RS Coin, 
uh, where they kind of invented a cryptocurrency that uh, would be a drop-in replacement for conventional currencies. And uh, we're the first team to independently implement that. So if you take a look at our, our GitHub repos, you can see a full functional build of RS coin along with a lot of cool NixOp stuff to make it uh, deployable with a single script. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we do, um, but we're always open for interesting ideas and projects. And that's one of the cool things about our company. Everything is open source and we try to collaborate with everybody. And as a result, uh, we get a lot of ideas that are sent our way. And we say, wow, if only we had the resources or, okay, I don't care if we have the resources, we're still going to go do that. So what are some of the, the projects you've built through that or some of the clients you've built for? Can you share anything about that? We have um, one major project that we're working on, which will be released in December, and we're still under NDA, so it's gradually being lifted. So around September to uh, October, we'll probably make a, a, a larger, more prominent announcement, but it's a multi-tiered cryptocurrency with a settlement control and an application domain, uh, and uh, it's uh, going to be really cool. It looks like it's going to be on proof of stake. We actually have a, a fully formalized proof of stake coming out this month with security proofs and everything. We started with the GKL 15 model and just worked our way from there. Uh, but uh, that's one of our biggest projects that we work on. But then we also work on smaller projects. For example, Alex is the director of Scorex. And in the interview, we'll have a long conversation about uh, what Scorex is and why Alex did it. Uh, you know, RS Coin is a project we work on. And then we have some internal projects we haven't announced yet, which we think are going to be really fun and cool. So what's the reason why you're setting this up like that, that you have this research arm and then doing this a lot of different projects? Why not choose something and, and go all in on that and, and build some uh, substantial projects? Do you kind of view the services side as, as kind of funding the, the research side? Yeah, in a way it does that. Um, and that's, that's the cool thing. So, you know, the reality is that 80% uh, of the good tech for the space, in my view, hasn't been built yet or researched yet. Uh, so I, I want to have a company that has a very substantial and meaningful impact on the future of this space. And so my goal is to uh, get as much research done as quickly as possible, get it all out into the open domain in the form of white papers at major conferences or in code, and make it available to everybody. Because I believe that this technology causes a cascading disruption to society. You know, when the internet came out, uh, if you think about how information worked before the internet, uh, you know, let's say a library. It took time, effort, and money to move information. Yeah, I remember as a kid, I had to ride my bicycle to the library to grab the book, you know, check it out, go home, you know, and then when the book was due, go back, uh, and that took effort. Then the internet comes out, and then in information moves instantaneously, and this was a massive disruption to society. And whatever disruptions occur, they always expose um, infrastructural problems. For example, uh, the internet exposed that there are serious problems behind how our financial system works. Just like when cars came out, they exposed that maybe the roads that we had weren't good enough and we needed to upgrade those roads. So uh, it's really exciting to have a company where we get to kind of define or at least make a major contribution to a lot of the core technologies that's going to rebuild the world's financial infrastructure. And uh, my hope is to make it uh, built in a way that's more transparent, more accountable, as well as more inclusive. So that's why we started the company, because we wanted to have a very proactive say in where this tech is going to go and a very philosophical say in saying that tech needs to be open, free, patent free and transparent, as opposed to where you know, other organizations may want to take it uh, as just an extension of an existing business model. So uh, I checked out IOHK's website before, the, uh, before this interview, and I realized that most of the researchers were from, from Asia and Russia in Eastern Europe. So is there a particular reason why you chose that, like, why this is so? Or is it like a deliberate strategy of any kind? Well, I mean, to be fair, we also have very strong roots in Japan. In fact, we actually have a research partnership with Tokyo Tech. And Mario Larnchera lives in uh, Tokyo. So we're pretty diverse. Um, it just came from that the developers and researchers that we initially recruited happened to have a geographic bias. But it wasn't done on purpose. Um, you know, the other thing is that the, the company is trying to be inclusive. Uh, so we don't want to make this just another Silicon Valley startup or something like that, where we're just going to make rich white people richer. If your goal is to um, make the technology as inclusive and as global as possible, you probably should start talking about how do we get people in Eastern Europe and Russia and India and in Central Asia and Africa and other places in South America. We actually have a South American team in Buenos Aires uh, involved. 
Uh, number one, because they're just as bright as everybody else and they can make very meaningful contributions. But more importantly, a lot of these people come from financial systems which are intrinsically bad. You, you don't have to go ahead and talk to a guy in Argentina about what if your money goes bust. It's already happened multiple times. Uh, if you look at Ukraine, the money's not working so well there. Russia's gone through some hard times in terms of its monetary policy. So it's nice to have researchers on your staff who really get it from a societal end. If you live in America, we've never really had a major currency crisis where we had to worry, is the dollar in my pocket going to be worth substantially less tomorrow or next week than it is today and have to plan for that? Whereas if you've lived in Ukraine, Russia, or Argentina, or other places, you actually have had that worry. So when you say maybe we should build a better kind of money, a new kind of money, it's not only just an academic and a research interest, but it's also a personal interest. So I guess that's why it's been easy to attract talent in that respect. Uh, but we're inclusive, and uh, a lot of our Eastern, uh, Western talent excuse me, comes from university partnerships that we've been setting up. And we'll make some announcements over the, uh, the summer and the fall about who we're working with in England and in other places. So I've also noticed that you actually have a, a very uh, large team. I think it's around maybe 30 people uh, you mentioned somewhere. Um, did you guys raise uh, venture funding, or how, how is the company structured? We're one of the that very few cryptocurrency companies that actually makes revenue. Uh, so we, uh, we've, we've made quite a bit and uh, we're solvent for many years with or without any future revenue. So we've actually not taken any VC money. It was initially self-funded and uh, we just sold our services and uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, so that's, uh, that's also a really cool uh, thing for me because I, I don't have a VC master or something and some you know, short-term expectation of an immediate return. At some point, we probably will get a VC partner. And then and the hard choice for us is should we do that in China or in Asia, where we're trying to base a lot of our initial products and optimizations and things like that? Or should we go to Silicon Valley and gather some money there? And that's still an open conversation. But uh, we're doing quite well, and the team is going to grow. I think we'll probably be at around 50 by the end of the year. Um, and then by the end of next year, about 100. Well, sounds, sounds really cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of these announcements that are going to come out of I IOHK in the future. Well, the first one is going to be our proof of stake paper. We're, we're really proud of that because it's a good piece of research and it'll be coming out sometime this month. Okay. So later in the show, uh, when we discuss uh, Ethereum Classic, we'll obviously talk about um, whether Ethereum Classic should transition to proof of stake in the future. And uh, obviously that also ties into Casper and that proof of stake algorithm. So perhaps we could spend a bit of time on understanding what's the difference between your proof of stake work and, and Casper, but probably that's for later. We'd like to start off with uh, talking about Scorex first, because personally, uh, when I went to the Scorex website and I checked out the project, it was, it was, it was something that I could really identify with. So, um, so Scorex, as far as I understand is basically, uh, kind of, uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a blockchain design that's very modular, and it's quite simple because it has only four thousand lines of code, so and it enables various kinds of applications in education and research. So let's 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 talk about what the aims of this Corex project are. And Alex, could you walk us through why you why you built this why you built Scorex? Uh, so Scorex uh, was started uh, as kind of weekend project. Uh, in order to check some properties of uh, modified uh, NXT uh, proof of stake consensus protocol. And uh, later, uh, you know, it becomes uh, a modular framework. Exactly. So I started uh, with aim to build something uh, simple. And uh, then uh, I uh, realized uh, that the simple product uh, could be not so good for experiments. So uh, it's not enough uh, to, to be simple uh, you, you also need to, to have modular structure and um, that's how i uh, went to the current state of scoring so for now uh, you know you can change a transactional model or, or consensus model and uh, leave other parts intact and uh, then uh, wire parts into an application and uh, run it against a testbed uh, real testbed very easily uh, but for now, I am going to next release. Uh, it uh, will come in September, I hope. And uh, 
It will come uh, uh, also with a kind of uh, tutorial and also a treatise on. Uh, uh, just a second. So, if you if you take a step back, uh, can you just like what is scores? Because it's not a cryptocurrency, right? Uh, yes, it's not a cryptocurrency, and it's not uh, intended at the moment to build uh, cryptocurrencies. So, um, you know what's uh, needed uh, for people in academias and also in the industry. So, uh, for example, uh, guys in uh, academias are writing uh, some paper. Uh, usually, they do not understand uh, how to implement it and. Uh, uh, there is usually a lack of resources uh, in order to implement a proposal. Uh, so here uh, uh, the scorex comes. Uh, so you can, for example, try your new consensus protocol, uh, leaving uh, a transactional part without any changes and uh, test your product uh, very quickly. We're going to test. Uh, in the same way, you can uh, Consensus part and change transactional language, and uh, also uh, test uh, things very quickly. And uh, so, Scorex is uh, for experiments and uh, for quick prototyping. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO Eric Larchevêque tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device. Your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with uh, Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app. With the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. It was mentioned in the, I think, in the wiki, wiki uh, for Scorex that it was actually inspired by or partially inspired by by Tezos. So some of our listeners will remember that we we did an episode on that a few weeks ago. And one of the aspects of Tezos was that that he kind of divided uh, cryptocurrency protocols in a few different uh, layers, which was the consensus layer, transaction layer, networking layer, and and state. I think. Uh, so if I understand correctly, right, with Scorex. It has kind of the same divisions, and then it allows to make changes in, at any of those levels and thus kind of experiment very quickly and see, okay, how do different combinations of technologies work on different levels? Is that kind of roughly what the, the goal of the project is? Uh, so, yeah, it was initially started with uh, exactly this design, so consensus part, transactional part, and uh, you can get uh, network uh, parts almost for free, just plug in uh, concrete. Uh, sub protocols needed uh, for your application uh, but uh, for now uh, we are also going to to go deeper with the uh, basic concepts of a blockchain system for example if we are talking about uh, a state so the question is uh, what uh, the state is about in a blockchain system and why it's needed and what is a transaction and so on, and uh, so we are going uh, to answer these questions and uh, to describe the basic uh, concepts in uh, the form of uh, the functional code. So getting uh, some uh, guarantees uh, from uh, the type system of the program language we are using, which is Scala. Yeah, um, just to jump in, uh, what interested me most about the project, if you're a service company and you build cryptocurrencies for people, 
they're going to have business requirements which will map onto either existing research or onto new research that's required. And so we needed a prototyping platform. And when we saw Scorex, we said, wow, this is something that's an extremely well thought out, uh, really good approach. It just needs more development effort, more time to mature. That was one of, uh, that was kind of the eat your own dog food for our end. The other thing is that we, we talk a lot with academic partners um, and people from Lancaster to VCU and to others. And they always come to us and say, there's a tremendous amount of interest in blockchain technology at our university, but we, we need some sort of pedagogical framework uh, so that we can teach the class from that framework. Or else uh, what we're going to have to do is go to Bitcoin, download 100,000 lines of spaghetti code and shift our way through it and hope that we can kind of figure it out where 80% of the code is uh, perhaps there to address real life edge cases, but is not instructive in how a cryptocurrency is designed. So having 4,000 lines of code in a highly modular framework where things are nicely separated into different layers is a really powerful thing from a, from a teaching standpoint. Finally, if you are a researcher and let's say you're creating a new consensus algorithm or you're testing a new type of anonymity scheme, you want everything to be, except for the thing you're doing, stable and predictable, and you just want to focus on the thing you're doing. So I just want to focus on the consensus algorithm. I don't necessarily want to think too much about my transaction language or any of these things. And so it's really nice to have that kind of modular viewpoint when you're taking a white paper and you're talking about potential implementation paths. So that was the you know, initial starting point for, uh, for Scorex from uh, my end. And uh, Alex has done an extraordinary job putting things together in a very short period of time. I, Alex, I think you started this last year in like September or something? It was started actually in December 2014, but okay. yeah, it's been developed uh, very slowly for right. a few months because but I had two, two projects right. to work on. So, right. Uh, yeah, now, now we are developing uh, fast with uh, four people in the team, and we also have some uh, additional results. Uh, for example, you can uh, use uh, an implementation of uh, version of uh, Merkle tree, so uh, authenticated skip list, uh, without using scores. Uh, they are residing in the separate uh, framework, uh, which contains uh, cryptography primitives and some protocols implementation uh, in Scala language. And uh, also, we are going. Uh, to try to build a uh, kind of uh, version of a uh, key value database uh, to use it in uh, different uh, blockchain systems internally. So you can uh, get uh, from our observation an improvement of a uh, constant factor and uh, that could be uh, very good. By the way, just by replacing uh, somewhat uh, general database with uh, a specialized one. Cool. Like Yes, Codex, Codex sounds really interesting. Like, I think two years back, I, I tried myself to have a stab at the Bitcoin code base. And I think I, I, I lost hope in a month or so. Because uh, like, it was, it was hopelessly big and it was hopelessly complex. And I wish like Codex was around at that time. Because, you know, 4,000 lines of code seems way more approachable than the 80,000 80, lines of code Bitcoin has. Uh, so, so perhaps it, 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 like I could, I could try that. I could try that experiment on Scorex now and actually try to understand the cryptocurrency from a very fundamental protocol level. So this is a project that, that I, I found really exciting. Uh, you know, there's an old engineer's adage, which says that uh, perfection is achieved, not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. And I think Da Vinci used to say that uh, simplicity is the ultimate elegance and it's very expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to try to figure out how to do things more concisely and in a much more understandable way than just you know writing a, a big monolith of code. So uh, that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to work with Alex because very few people can do can write a full cryptocurrency uh, or at least a reasonable approach to a cryptocurrency in just a few thousand lines of code. That's not a common thing. Uh, so I, I recognize there was a hidden brilliance there, and it's been a heck of a lot of fun watching the project mature over time. Uh, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Like, uh, for example, we have to decide on a governance structure for Scorex moving forward. You know, it's right now an IOHK project, but people are already starting to use the code to launch cryptocurrencies. For example, Waves uh, has decided to use our code base. Uh, it's open source, anybody can. 
uh, but that doesn't mean we endorse a particular project or not. But as long as it's an IOHK asset, then that's kind of a problem. So our hope is to pull it out kind of like what Joylent did with Node and put it into its own independent uh, governance structure and uh, make it a little bit more uh, community driven than just uh, corporate sponsorship driven, which is an ongoing conversation. And if anybody has some good ideas, I'd love to hear them. It, uh, it's uh, going to be a, a joint effort. Yeah, that governance topic is definitely one that we keep coming back to, and I think that's one of the one of the big open unsolved problems in, in the space that's affecting all kinds of projects. Among other things, also it has been affecting kind of a project that uh, you were involved in early on, which is Ethereum. Right, it has been going through a little bit of a crisis recently, so. You've now gotten involved again in some way, uh, specifically with Ethereum Classic. I think you're the most uh, well-known uh, person who sort of says, okay, I'm going to put some effort into that, try to get that somewhere. You also wrote a very interesting post on, on Steemit. Of course, we will have a, a link to that where you kind of talk very much in depth about your views uh, in there. So I, I would just love to start this discussion by maybe uh, taking a little bit of a, a step back and and asking you to share a bit about when you originally got involved in Ethereum, um, how that was, and what caused you to to depart at that time. Because in the Steemit post, you were referring to that as a as a philosophical division uh, that happened at that time. Okay, um, so uh, Ethereum, it's like Scorex or other projects kind of started as like an accident, you know, it's just a uh, weekend passion or something and uh, I didn't expect much to come of it. Uh, so uh, Anthony DiOrio and I were going to do some joint effort on an education project. So at the time I was running a couple of things, but the most prominent was the Bitcoin education project where I'd released a MOOC called Bitcoin or how I stop or uh, learn to stop worrying and love crypto. I'm a big Peter Sellers fan uh, for Dr. Strangelove. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Anthony wanted to do some educational content for the uh, Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. And uh, as many people are aware, Vitalik and Anthony uh, live in the same city. They both lived in Toronto. And uh, Anthony had been given an, a very early draft of the Ethereum white paper. And this time it was like a overlay protocol on PrimeCoin or something like that. So Anthony said, I, you know, I, I, I'd love for you to take a look at the paper and uh, let me know what you think. And I said, sure. So I read the paper and I said, wow, whoever wrote this is really smart and it's a really good idea. It, it's going to require a little bit of retooling and reconfiguration. And you know, there's uh, going to be some careful hands that are going to need to be involved, but I think there's something viable here. Uh, so uh, they said, well, there's a couple of guys uh, and there was four of them at the time who were talking regularly. Uh, would you like to start attending those meetings and talk to them? And I said, sure. So I did. Uh, and those guys were Amir Shatrit, Mihai Alicia, Anthony and Vitalik. Uh, and then there was two volunteer developers who were really pushing things forward. One of them used the Skype handle, I think it was Obscurin, and we didn't know who he was, but we knew that he worked for some cryptocurrency project and uh, you know, he uh, you know, m might not be well received if he was working on something else. And the other one was Gavin uh, Wood, and his name I think was Gav of York or something, because he went to York. So uh, Gavin, Jeff, and that was Obscurin, uh, we found out later on it was Jeff Wilchie. Uh, we're writing code. Uh, Jeff was doing Go and Gavin was doing uh, uh, C++ implementation. And uh, Anthony and I were just trying to figure out, like, how the hell do we structure this thing? Is this going to be just a one-off project that gets released uh, that we move on? Or are we going to try to build a company? Or what are we going to do? So eventually we decided, hey, let's just get everybody to go down to Miami because we've been invited to a conference there. And this was around January of 2014. Mo Levin put on this big North American Bitcoin conference. He said, let's just go there, uh, announce Ethereum, and see what kind of interest we can get. And I said, that sounds fun. So uh, Anthony ran at a beach house, which was real generous. And we all went down there. And it was a standard Miami party beach house, which was fun. Uh, and we had a lot of people there. There's probably 20, 30 people at every given moment. And uh, we went and did some presentations. I did a debate with Dan Larimer and uh, David Johnston. Uh, and then Vitalik went ahead and announced Ethereum, and uh, both were very well received. Vitalik especially, uh, he became a rock star overnight, and all these people mobbed him and came on in. And we said, okay, we have something really special here. So uh, we realized that uh, we needed to be a little bit smarter about launch strategy, and we had to do something a bit more robust and st uh, stable and secure. So I said, well, why don't we set up in a stable, nice jurisdiction 
uh, where we, we have uh, uh, a lot of ability to kind of grow without having to worry about a lot of bizarre legal edge cases or it's not a banana republic and we have to worry that the nation's going to change or something. So after a lot of discussions, we decided to base ourselves in Switzerland, in Zug, which is a wonderful canton. Actually, I believe I met Mahar there. Uh, and uh, anyway, I flew out there with a lot of other people and we did the initial legal work of getting it done. At the same time, we had an open question of what does a crowd sale mean from a US perspective? So we retained a law firm and we asked them to write a, a letter of opinion, uh, what's called a more likely than not opinion on what exactly is the ether sale from a US perspective. So uh, after getting those two things done, there was an open question of how should the project be governed and managed moving forward? Uh, because we had a good team, because there, there was a lot of hype and excitement, there was like 50 meetup groups or something like that, the yellow paper had been pushed out, four or five proof of concepts had been done, the VC interest was getting really hot. Uh, and this was right around when Blockstream was closing its round. So there was this common notion that Ethereum could be funded at the same level. Uh, so we got a couple of offers and I started realizing, wow, we were a real big project, we're very bloated, there's lots of people. Uh, they're very passionate, but maybe not necessarily the best people to stick around long term. We need to centralize the project in Switzerland. Uh, we should probably take a VC investment, get a strong board of directors who have a lot of experience with things like software engineering and a lot of experience with project management to keep us on schedule and on track and make sure we don't make any stupid moves. And then once that's done and the protocol's finished, start a not-for-profit and have a crowd sale distribute the initial token set from the uh, not-for-profit and then the uh, for-profit company can kind of be the DAP developer and build things on top of Ethereum, similar to what you're now seeing with Augur and Slocket and all these other ventures that have had proposals. So that was my idea. Um, obviously, uh, there were other ideas on how to run things, and uh, I was on the losing side. So I left, um, and it was mutual. So uh, they went on and raised $18 million uh, from a stufthung and uh, spent nearly all of it within a year and uh, then released Ethereum. Uh, and uh, all the founders, most of them scattered and went to start other ventures uh, like uh, uh, S-Core and other things like that. You know, it, it is what it is. The reality is when you start an open source project and there's lots of people at the beginning who have different views and philosophies, there's going to be divisions that eventually become apparent when the passion and excitement starts going down and you get into the nitty gritty of running a company. This is why there are very few companies that are successful when they have eight founders. Usually it's two guys or a guy and a gal or three or something like that. It's hard to point to the great Silicon Valley success where they had a committee running the company. So almost always some people get cut off and they go about their own direction. And that's fine. Uh, you know, I, I decided to go do something else with my life and my life is great. I love my life. Uh, that said, the social contract of Ethereum, which is I think the core behind the division with Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, was initially this whole notion that code is law, despite what Tim Swanson and others say, uh, the idea that when I write code, just like in Bitcoin, when I send a transaction, it's just going to go. Whether it's good or bad, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, uh, this is what we signed up for. Uh, or else, why are we going to the effort of building the world's most inefficient computer? And why are we going to the effort to build the world's most uh, expensive computer relative to its peers? Uh, you want to have a guarantee that I have a decentralized network that doesn't care about the nature of the code that's running uh, running it. Um, now, that's a little risky. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of out there on the edge, but that was really the point, and that's what made the project to me so initially exciting. And for the last two years, that has been the mantra of Ethereum. They've invented words. They've done tons of videos, uh, and that didn't change, despite the fact that we had differences about governance and how to spend money and who should be in charge and uh, all that stuff, which is reasonable. Uh, we never differed on the core philosophy of the system until recently with the DAO attack. And then all of a sudden the philosophy diverged where sometimes censorship's okay, sometimes forking is okay to reverse things as long as you have some community consensus, which I like to call the six wolves and four sheep voting on what's for dinner clause, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> <laughs> so... Do you think there's a connection between what happened now around this choice with the fork and what happened back then with the choices around should there be a crowd sale, should one raise VC money, should one try to have a more sort of proper structure and organization as opposed to sort of a, a big, uh, a big uh, kind of disorganized everyone's 
pulling or working together approach? No, I don't think so. I think the, the, the case of when I left, it was just a case that everybody was really young and they were all decentralized and siloed and uh, people were kind of walking their own book and they had their own ideas of where things needed to be. And there was just too many people. There was too many chefs and it was hard to decide what was for dinner. Um, that's a slightly different situation. With respect to the hard fork, uh, this is an issue where there's clear governance. There's the Ethereum Foundation and there's a strong cult of personality around Vitalik. He's the leader, got everybody a 60X. So he's got a lot of street cred. Uh, and, uh, and, and when that organization said, let's go do this, they have a lot of power to do that. But what they, I think, failed to understand was that uh, there is a world of difference between making a decision to upgrade, optimize, or change something for the better of the system and to change the social contract that a lot of people signed up for. Regardless of how powerful you are or regardless of who you are, some minority of your population will not agree with you to the extent where they will forcibly leave your system if you try to change the social contract. And I think it's just a learning experience for them. And it's something they have to now take very seriously moving into the future because their roadmap has five, I think, hard forks over the next two years. So when I, when I look at the Ethereum hard fork, um, what's, what stand out, stands out to me is uh, the, this particular hard fork is in a sense uh, it is it is a repudiation of uh, let's say the code code is law paradigm that I, most of the ethereum community was subscribing to prior, prior to that mm -hmm. but it is also in a way a repudiation of some some bitcoin principles let's say bitcoin principles quote unquote for lack of a better word that all of us had been subscribing to like when satoshi came out with 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 bitcoin and for the first few years of the existence of Bitcoin, people were really worried that there was going to be a government clampdown mm -hmm. and th there was going to be some kind of force that uh, that puts, pushes through some regulation in this system. And the only way the community thought uh, you could avoid that is to not have a center at all. Like, like Satoshi disappeared and then we didn't have a center in the, in the system where you could necessarily push through some kind of blacklist or censorship or hard fork or whatever, right? And from, for many years, this was kind of like Bitcoin has held true to true to this model. Now for the, I think the reason the hard fork of Ethereum is really interesting is, is the first time we have, we have a cryptocurrency in which, uh, which has a huge market cap. And also you see that there is, a, a center inside that cryptocurrency. There's this Vitalik, and then there's this group of people, the community, and there are people who have more important opinions in that community. And you can see that as kind of a center. And this hard fork really pushed through the idea that there does exist a center, definitively. Uh, whereas before the hard fork, you could have argued that there is no center. And, uh, and I, th I personally think that, like, for example, many people in the ETC Ethereum Classic community are actually rebelling against the affirmation that there is a center now. Do you, do you think that is the problem with, with the hard fork or the problem is just that immutability was broken? Well, I think it's a little bit of everything. I, I mean, the challenge with building a decentralized movement. And, and, and every cryptocurrency, frankly, goes through this, even if it's small. I mean, Alex probably has some horror stories about next. Uh, the, the reality is that there are camps and tribes and everybody has their own kind of ideas of how things should be and where things should be. And usually there's a very few set of meta concepts that are, are unifying everybody. And it reminds me of Genghis Khan when he like unified the Mongol hordes uh, he had very simple laws for the hordes to follow, and every every tribe had to have them displayed, and violating them was a death sentence. Outside of that, you know, you had a lot of freedom to kind of do what you want to do, and that's that's kind of the management model that cryptocurrencies generally have. Um, Ethereum is unique in that it has a center. Its its Satoshi is still around, and these are very bright, very passionate, very talented people, and generally speaking, their ideas are valid and good. And from a technological standpoint, or have been uh, have been reasonable, uh, but yet 
The problem is that uh, you don't sign up in a cryptocurrency to be governed or managed by a hierarchy and have a CEO at the top tell you what to do. The whole point of having a decentralized system is that nobody's really in charge. Everybody has a couple of different voices and you know we kind of figure it out. And Bitcoin saw this with Gavin and Drayson. He was kind of the big guy after Satoshi left and he had an opinion of where Bitcoin should go and he was overruled in that opinion, right? Whereas Vitalik was able to pull it off. So it's an interesting thought experiment to kind of think about where would have Bitcoin gone? Let's say if Gavin was successful and we had done that fork, would there be a Bitcoin classic with the, orig with the original uh, you know, one megabyte block size and how much population would have been on both sides? We're kind of seeing that experiment play itself out with, uh, with Ethereum. Um, so you know that's that's kind of the the best non-answer that I can give to your to your question in general. It, to, to me, it's it's too hard to say. What, uh, but I will point out one last thing that when you lead, you make decisions, and every decision has a pro and a con for everybody. It's always there's always referential, and over time the cons accumulate, and subtle anger builds, uh, and eventually some subset of the population just starts disliking you because of the way that you lead. And so I think there is a meaningful subset of the population that has disliked uh, the way the Ethereum Foundation has governed Ethereum, and they constitute some of Ethereum Classic. There's Bitcoin maximalists who have come into Ethereum Classic who are very attracted to this code of law paradigm, and they like that it's making a commitment to be decentralized. Um, and there's obviously other camps, and it's hard for me to say who thinks what and what is the dominant camp and something like that. It's kind of a big sociological experiment. Alex, let's have your thoughts. I'm with you, Mihir. Uh, so Ethereum uh, hard fork edition now definitely has a very huge uh, center of power. And, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, uh, developers are balanced with the miners. So we have centralization among miners, but uh, developers and uh, miners are balanced each other. And uh, we don't have uh, this in Ethereum and uh, even more. Uh, eventually, miners uh, will be thrown away uh, by switching to proof of stake. Uh, so, from my point of view, it's definitely the problem, and uh, here is the Ethereum Classic hopefully uh, go to have a balance uh, between uh, developers and uh, miners. Right. That's, that's a good point. I mean, Ethereum has decided to poison the chain and make it unminable at some point with the difficulty bomb, and there's obviously going to be a subset of people, particularly miners, uh, who think that's a bad way to go, or people who think proof of work is an intrinsically superior consensus mechanism than proof of stake. Um, so, and you know, the other thing that Ethereum Classic has proven is that service providers have a lot of power. If you're an exchange, you have a lot of power, uh, and people tended to underestimate that, and uh, Poloniex really showed that that was the case. Uh, so it's something that you have to understand, even if you are the custodian or the official center of the ecosystem, you're not quite as powerful as you think you are, even if you have a, a lot of power. Today's magic word is crossroads. That's C-R-O-S-S-R-O-A-D-S. -S -S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward. I certainly understand the objection to the fork. I think it's a very, you're certainly right that there has been uh, this, um, this kind of advertising slogan or, well, advertising slogan or this kind of, the, the way Ethereum has been communicated, it was always, oh, it's this world computer, yeah, uncensorable, immutable, uh, you know, illegal, whatever. That, um, Illegality or something uh, like that. Yes. Um, With an A. Yeah, with an A <laughs> and one L, no, two L. Uh, <laughs> um, but at the same time, it did seem like there was certainly a, a very significant majority of uh, of people uh, in the Ethereum community were in favor of the hard fork. Certainly, basic, almost all of the application developer, uh, mm -hmm. almost all of the main uh, developers. Um, now it's, it's certainly also true that most were not really consulted or there was not an efficient way to consult people, 
but but still, I think it's it's very clear that the vast majority was uh, was in favor of that. Um, so well, I'm going to challenge you on that. I mean, you guys have okay. Robin Hansen on your show, and remember the core thing about Futarki: you have values and beliefs, and these are separate. So it's perfectly okay to have values. Say that I believe in this set of values, and this is my idea, but my belief is that the world is going to go differently. If the Ethereum Foundation, which has all the money and all the developers, wants to go in a certain way, your belief is that's the direction you need to get behind, even if that violates your values. And if you're running a business and if you are looking for a population, uh, then you're just going to go with whatever's best for your bottom line or whatever's best uh, for, for the highest probability of success. So just because a DAP developer or a miner or somebody moves to chain A over B does not necessarily infer that they believe in that chain and they believe in the values of that chain. More, it just is a indication of their belief in the success of that chain, which is an entirely separate thing. Yeah, no, no, I, ex I accept that point. I think I think you're correct around that, that there essentially was a sort of, um, you know, a, a, a congregation around that choice for whatever reason, whether that was uh, a belief that one would follow the majority or the belief that it was actually the right thing. Right. Uh, but what was what drove you to say, okay, I'm gonna get involved again and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to support this particular project that has that has very little buy-in from the existing Ethereum community. Why why come back? Well, you know, that's a good question. So my interest is academic mostly. You know, the, the reality is that there are plenty of things that I would do differently if I was in charge of the Ethereum roadmap. And they're going in a particular direction. And uh, you know, I, I tend to come from the mathematical world, as does Alex and a lot of the other people on my team. So when we think about code as law, the first thing that comes to mind is that code better probably be written really well, because you know, if you if you miswrite it, there's serious consequences to it, as we've seen. So the focus that Ethereum has been uh, pushing is is developer accessibility. So they created a programming language that looks a lot like JavaScript. And it's not particularly easy to write high assurance software in. So one of the areas of divergence in my thinking is we really need to have some sort of functional DSL that is uh, is easy to write proofs with, you know, almost like Idris or something like that. Second, I would have built a verified compiler. There's very few reasons in life that you'd want to go down that road, unless you're Xavier Leroy or something like that. And you have the Gallium group with you. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, this is like a cookie cutter definition of why you would want to have something like that. So there's a, a lot of little edge things that I'm really interested in doing. And, and I think smart contracts are going to be here to stay. And frankly, as a company that builds things for people, it's worth my time and my company's money to build infrastructure and tools and put them up on the shelf in case a client comes to me and they have some sort of requirement that needs this type of high assurance code. The fact that we would be able to uh, potentially test that on a live network is a really amazing thing. Uh, so, you know, academically, it's extremely worthwhile from a business uh, standpoint, it's worthwhile to just have that software there. Furthermore, I don't really care about the split and app developers right now. It's like saying you're a grain of sand on the beach and, you know, 90% of that grain of sand is against you. Like it's, there's a beach. We haven't even gotten to the beach. We're just this grain, right? There's a very small relative to the, uh, to the cloud computing world uh, population of developers currently in Ethereum, very small. So I think there's plenty of time to differentiate and plenty of time to build a compelling uh, DAP experience within the Ethereum Classic world that is novel and different from the experience presented for Ethereum. And the types of applications that will be deployed on that system will be intrinsically different than the types of applications that will be deployed upon Ethereum. Furthermore, Ethereum has now opened itself up to competition, which is extremely vicious. When you have abandoned the code as law, and this is the platform that's always going to run it, and now we're just another cloud computing platform, now all of a sudden you have to contend with Juno and Project Bletchley and all these other things that are coming out, some of which have the backing of multi-billion dollar companies that have unfair advantages. And uh, let's never forget that the Ethereum VM uh, is extremely inefficient when compared to a federated computation model. So if if my goal is just to be a world computer and, and have a federated trust model, why in God's name wouldn't I want to put my money behind Rackspace and Amazon and Microsoft who have decades of experience and some of the best engineers in the world and just be really careful about the trust pairings 
uh, and pick enough of them that it's probably going to be okay because the jurisdictions are played against each other. You know, that, that to me makes a lot more sense because I'm going to have an easier time with deployment. It's going to be interoperable with existing infrastructure and existing applications that I have. The cost is going to be considerably lower. I'm probably going to have better tooling. I'm probably going to be able to use languages, standard languages like C Sharp and C++, as opposed to having to learn entirely new languages and an entirely new VM. Why would you want to compete in that space? It makes no sense to me. I would rather be the code is law guy because then basically the, the, we're the only option. We have a monopoly in that space and we can grow and see how big that philosophy is. And yet certainly over time, we can work at making the system uh, more efficient, probably via interoperability with these other systems. Alex? Yes, guys. Uh, going down to the philosophical problems to purely technical ones. So we already have uh, two kinds of Ethereum going to be happening. So that is Ethereum and uh, Rootstock, maybe, you know. Uh, the project uh, based on the Ethereum from uh, Sergio Demian Lerner. And uh, I think eventually we can have uh, three kinds of Ethereum. That is uh, Rootstock, Ethereum uh, Bailout Edition, and uh, Ethereum Classic. So uh, Bailout Edition uh, will be on proof of stake with a somewhat uh, shunning scheme and so on and so on. And Ethereum Classic will be more conservative with uh, proof of work and uh, maybe some uh, conservative fixes in the core. And uh, yeah, we will have a lot of options around uh, the general idea of a decentralized computer. That's nice from my point of view. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Let's now focus on Ethereum Classic, right? Like Okay, the past is the past, but let's let, let let's let's focus the rest of the talk on kind of uh, the the future. And when I look at Ethereum Classic, um, I tend to see that there are like lots of challenges around around this cryptocurrency. So let me let me let me think of some things I see, and then uh, then perhaps you, you could add other things that you see. So for instance, one of the big challenges is. Um, what happens with governance and this is very important because the the money supply schedule of original unforked ethereum was not defined ever like how many coins are we going to have maximum what what is going was it, what is it going to behave like etc now you could argue that in the forked version of ethereum that is being led, led by the ethereum foundation there's still the same team right uh, and and they can exercise their influence in coming up with a with a monetary supply schedule. But on the classic side, now the classic community now faces a unique kind of problem. Uh, they don't have a monetary supply schedule like like Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't have a center or 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 defined leadership or defined defined governance today. And they have basically two parts of the community that want completely different things from the money supply schedule so the miners want want a lot of coins to be created in the future because they earn that as revenue the users want less number of coins to be created in the future because more coins creates inflation for them so the the needs of the users and miners are opposed to each other they are, but they are in in a system that doesn't have a defined schedule and uh, doesn't even have a defined governance structure. How will Ethereum Classic ever recover from this? You know, that's a great question. Um, it reminds me almost like Bitcoin in the early days. You know, it wasn't defined governance structure. Sometimes the founder was there, sometimes he wasn't. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody was kind of just doing their own thing, yet Bitcoin has evolved. So there are four things that need to happen for Ethereum Classic to stabilize and be successful outside of market manipulation and other things that are occurring, perhaps with the DAO hacker coins and other things like that. Um, so number one, you need a social contract. So there's a meta contract, like code is law, but there's still some hard decisions that have to be made about exactly what this movement stands for. Uh, and there'll be some filtering, unfortunately. Okay, number two, after you have a social contract, you need a development roadmap. And the development roadmap worries not only about the technology, okay, whether we're gonna stay on proof of work or proof of stake or do a hybrid, or we're gonna use proof of proof of work to reduce transaction validation times or whatever the hell. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that you have to carefully think about uh, in the development roadmap, but it also has to interpret the social contract the community assigned and then makes explicit code statements about that, namely, the governance structure, as well as uh, the money supply, the monetary policy of the cryptocurrency. And then finally, you need to have people who are responsible for executing that, either on a volunteer or a permanent basis. And you need to make decisions about how much centralization those people have, okay? So right now, the community doesn't look like it wants to accept another foundation, or at least one that's hierarchical and powerful and domineering and controlling. Lucky for us, there's a lot of good ideas from some ideas in the Dash community and perhaps the Monero community. There's ideas uh, BitShares came up with. There's ideas Robin Hansen came up with. Uh, Ralph Merkel, the lovable Merkel, has come up with certainly some great ideas. So there's plenty of great ideas about how do we run the ship without necessarily having a captain and, uh, uh, and get that done. And uh, you know all of these things together, then there's a question of how many resources are actually going to be available to get it done. So that's the funding question. Now, if you don't have those four things, a social contract, a reasonable development roadmap, a governance structure, and money to get it done, you're not a good cryptocurrency. You're not a stable cryptocurrency. And uh, that is the great challenge of Ethereum Classic. And if you're a person on the outside looking at Ethereum Classic, asking questions about whether it's going to survive or not, uh, you really, you, you have to examine what's the progress on those types of things. And I think over time, we will see a leadership structure in a decentralized way like we've seen with Bitcoin evolve. And I think we will see f some form of a governance structure evolve. Now, um, if that occurs, I would feel very comfortable. Now, to get to a specific answer about your question uh, about proof of work and the money supply, I think miners are reasonable. The thing about a miner is they run a business. And it's not necessarily about the Coinbase award that's coming in. It's about predictability and consistency behind the income flow. So they have to buy you know, a pool of equipment, X equipment, and they have to run it for time Y. Okay? And then when they do that, they have to make an assumption about how many coins they're going to get and how much value those coins have. And then they can do a calculation and say, is this a profitable endeavor or not profitable? So the miner cares much more about what is that window going to look like? Then rather, let's create an unlimited money supply and kill the currency so that we can get short-term gain. So uh, I think it's easy to get them to the table and have a conversation, especially considering that the other side, Ethereum, is planning on firing all of them. It's let's never forget that. Uh, you know, it's basically saying to these guys, hey, when we do Casper, you're gone. Uh, so they, they're either going to go to Litecoin or somewhere else. They can't go to Bitcoin because it's not an ASIC uh, POW, it's a GPU. So th that, that discussion has to be had, and it will be had, uh, and uh, some decisions will be made. Not everybody's going to agree. Some people will leave. Some people will be really excited about the certainty and start coming in. And as long as you're growing, as long as you have a positive ecosystem, you're leaving a legacy that does good things for people, I think it's worth everybody's time. Uh, if this is just a proposition to make a few insiders very wealthy, it's not worth anybody's time. So, uh, you know, from an outsider looking in, you need to see those four things. You need to see how the negotiations are going. And if they actually solidify, I think Ethereum Classic is going to be here for a very long time. If they don't solidify, regardless of how much money some people put in or what promises a mining pool makes, you're really talking about an unstable short-term proposition for Ethereum Classic. So I, I, I take it from the way you talk about this, that it will be essential for Ethereum Classic to, to come up with its own agenda, its own community, its own vision and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to go in that direction, which of course would imply, right, with different value, different people, that there would be much more of a divergence also of the code base in the future so that uh, maybe some things one would still use from Ethereum 
uh, and, and kind of uh, leverage the development that's happening in there. But in, in other things, there will be uh, uh, more of a divergence. And then probably in, in a few years, if it turns out that way, uh, the two systems would actually look very different. Is, is that how you see that playing out? Yeah, I'd love to see that. And, and that's why it was so unfortunate that the Ethereum Foundation took such an harsh anti-ETC viewpoint. I guess they just they let the damn passion recede for a minute and think it through logically. It's like saying, wow, if they diverge, we have an A-B test on smart contracts. We have a completely different and new ecosystem with a different philosophy where we get to say, what if? What if we made this decision instead of that decision? And now we get an actual uh, market price on the value of that. Uh, so I, I think it is reasonable, prudent, and frankly necessary for the survival of Ethereum Classic for it to diverge. The question is, where should it diverge? Should it attempt to be like a mass market cryptocurrency that appeals to everybody and gets as many DAP developers as possible? Um, or should it try to err on something that's not being focused on, which is safety and correctness? Uh, and uh, I would like to see the latter more than the former because it seems like Ethereum's roadmap is trying to be the former. It's trying to be this universally accessible world computer for everybody where uh, sometimes uh, the, you know, you're gonna screw up on writing things and that's okay. We can figure it out on the back end. So uh, it's, it's a good question though. We did recently the podcast with, yeah, with uh, Arthur Brightman on Tezos and, and there was, that was one of the things he talked about a lot, which was that uh, smart contracts, you know, it's high security software. You have a lot of money at stake. So writing it bug free is, is absolutely essential. And that solidity uh, is, is not uh, designed that way at all. And that is really unsuitable for it. It seems like you agree. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious here, because I've also asked this question to, uh, to some of the Ethereum people. And, and their point was kind of like, well, you know, the tools are being developed, we're developing functional testing tools, or, or it would be good to have other languages as well that might be more, uh, you know, more functional, more like uh, ready for proofs and stuff uh, built on top of the EVM. Whereas I think Arthur's stance was more like uh, the EVM itself also is not suitable. What's, what's your point of view here? Do you think going in that direction will... Uh, will also mean uh, making changes to the EVM and maybe abandoning the EVM completely? Yeah, that's, a, that's an extremely good question. And the answer is I don't know at the moment. Um, what needs to happen is a systematic deconstruction of the EVM and a comparison of it to other projects that are trying to do things in a more formal and reasonable way. And saying, is there a path to optimizing and improving this uh, that does not require us abandoning the design itself? Uh, or is it just simply too far of a, of a gulf and we're going to have to go do something else? And I'm not the most qualified person uh, to make that statement. What, what I'll probably try to do is attach a university partner that has a very strong group, kind of like INRIA or something like that, in these things and just give them three to six months to write a survey and say, all right, well, tell me, um, you know, what could we do with the EVM? Where could we take it? Um, it's also important to point out that this is not a, an Ethereum-only challenge. You know, one of the magical things about uh, Tesla as a company is that they stake their future not on their own brilliance and innovation, but in part on the brilliance and innovation of the entire battery industry, which has this enormous competitive pressure to, uh, to like make these guys last longer, right? So the advancements here give them cars with a longer range, and they don't have to pay any money for that. Similarly, there is a huge movement of people that are saying, can we create uh, uh, tools, uh, compilers, virtual machines, these things that are more secure and give us stronger guarantees. And what we need to start thinking about is how do we connect that tidal wave of investment and progress from everything from Microsoft Research to the guys doing CompCert and others to Ethereum and get that, uh, and get that done. That's what I'd like to do. And if it means that changes have to be made to the EVM, I think it's reasonable to propose them. Ideally, you want to maintain backward compatibility. You know, the other thing to, to point out is that does not necessarily mean you break compatibility with the dApps that have been written. Uh, you know, if I write, uh, you know, uh, uh, Haskell code, there's actually a way to compile Haskell to run on the Java virtual machine. It's called Frege, right? So similarly, if I write Solidity code, I, I can create all kinds of tools to convert that to run on a completely different machine than Ethereum runs. And this is probably going to end up having to be done because there's going to be divergence with rootstock and divergence with other people that are starting with the EVM and then kind of moving in a different direction. 
Uh, so it's much more important about the tooling in the meta than it is about how the underlying virtual machine itself runs. That's a more academic exercise. Uh, but I support some form of divergence. I support doing things like building verified compilers. I love functional programming languages. And I think that at the very least, your standard library of smart contracts that people sh should use for their apps should be written that way with proofs. Uh, and then maybe you can use other things to do prototyping. But that's the direction I'd like to take it, a very methodical, disciplined, systematic project progress that connects academic partners and has an understanding that industry is wanting to solve this problem as well and connect industry to it. Uh, my two cents. So from my observations, uh, it is not enough uh, to have much languages, so it's much needed. Uh, the problem also, developers must be taught uh, about uh, the very specific execution model of uh, the EVM and uh, blockchains. And, uh, well, again, from my observations, uh, people uh, wrote uh, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript scripts. Uh, yesterday, I usually do not understand uh, many difficulties and uh, many security issues around uh, this execution model. So it's better to write uh, a different uh, kind of tutorials. Uh, so instead of uh, writing things like, oh, that, that's very easy to, to write a smart contract. But that's not true. That's just not true. It's, it's very hard to, to write a flawless smart contract and uh, developers must be taught how to do that. And uh, unfortunately, not much developers are able uh, to write safe uh, smart contracts, even with the uh, best tools possible. Right, that's an extremely good point. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about uh, a standard web application where you can move fast and break things. You're talking about an execution model where, you know, the the system is merciless. If you make a mistake, it's your mistake. And uh, let's be fair to Ethereum, I don't anticipate them continuing to fork for small mistakes that are made. Perhaps larger things like another DAO event, they'll fork again, but I don't think they're gonna fork for uh, $500,000 at risk or a million dollars at risk. So uh, it's buyer beware. And I think it's, it's false advertising to a certain extent to try to lure people in to develop smart contracts and say, hey, let's do all this cool stuff when the reality is that these are extremely difficult things to write correctly. And um, they require a, a lot of careful thought planning, a lot of careful testing, and in some cases, tools that don't even fully exist yet. Uh, so that's just a caveat that many people need to understand, which is why I, I always advocated for, let's start for something that's functional, where we have very strong tooling that has evolved for a very long time and gradually work our way to accessibility. Instead of starting with accessibility, and trying to gradually work our way towards security. Uh, it just doesn't seem to work that way. And by the way, just as a, just as a disclaimer, um, Alex actually wrote a cock proof for um, the FLP impossibility theorem. So, so he, he tends to be on the, the very formal side of the computer science world. Uh, so, so you always know there's a slight bias there. Just to more sense from me. So as a concrete. Sense, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, I'll pay in Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. as a concrete example, uh, you know, of uh, difficulty a developer usually uh, doesn't think about. So, for example, if you are messing with a $1 million lottery, uh, you can have uh, problems. So, you are extracting random numbers uh, from uh, blockchain and you have problems even with uh, miners replaying blocks. And uh, you can have uh, rollback problems with uh, any uh, smart contract you are developing. And uh, you have uh, bounded execution uh, with the gas model and so on. So there are many security concerns about and uh, uh, someone needs to compile a list of uh, high level and low level problems and uh, that's uh, we have some work in this direction, but uh, much more is needed. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's just a great example of a lottery with a randomness extractor. If, if a certain group of people don't like the result, they could potentially have a portfolio of attacks to them that the app developer wasn't aware of that could change the result arbitrarily to benefit one or more parties. 
Uh, so you, you have to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of the EVM and, and the security guarantees of the consensus system to really understand how to write these contracts securely. Similarly to like if you're a Java developer, it wouldn't be just good enough to understand how to write Java code. You might have to understand how the Java virtual machine works. Uh, and as a side note, most people who do that, go down that road, end up creating their own programming language that compiles to the JVM like Martin Odersky did with Scala. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting uh, thing. I guess it's, it's like the continuum hypothesis of programming. If you get too close to it, you either go crazy or invent a new field of math or something. So one final question from me is, um, so I recently saw that uh, the some, some, some ETC community folks came up with this ETC declaration of independence document, right? And I presume, and I presume that the social contract of ETC will also be expressed in the English language eventually. Even though, even though we are dealing with code, we'll have sort of a social contract that expresses the social contract in English. Uh, my, my question to you would be, who came up with this document, ETC Declaration of Independence? How did it work? Whether you will make an English language document of the social contract, and if so, how will you... What is your threshold for consensus and how do you define it in, e in the ETC community? That's a very good question. So it's first important to understand I'm not a leader in the ETC community. I don't want to be one. Um, I, I was not directly involved in the construction of the declaration. So what happened is that a Slack channel uh, opened up and a lot of the guys who were putting in a lot of hours for ETC were invited to the channel and uh, they were given a collaborative document and they tried over several iterations to create something that they felt was a representative sample of the, um, of the community. Uh, so I took a look at the document, but I didn't contribute to the document. Uh, so they, uh, they went ahead and pushed it out and I'm glad that they did. And it seems fairly reasonable, the declaration, at least it's a starting point. And what's nice is to see um, whether people say that's a great thing or a terrible thing, because we actually learn something in both cases. And the only case is when there's kind of like no reception, and you don't get a good enough single signal. Now, with respect to the language and localization, it is important to understand that there needs to be a Chinese version at the very least, because there's a large mining community there. And uh, it's probably important to take a look at what is the core demographic of uh, ETC at the moment. So it'd be nice to do a survey and see where people are from and uh, what languages they speak and make sure that it's at least localized into the top three or top four or top five. As for a conversation about it, I think it's an iterative process. So you release a declaration, you have a big discussion about it. When you feel pretty comfortable, you move on to the development roadmap, you start making concrete proposals that are acting on that declaration. And then you're gonna have a lot of back and forth about the particular proposals, which is exposing potential problems in the declaration itself. And then you can kind of iterate and refine, iterate and refine, and eventually you get to something where you, you have a pretty good consensus or you have just massive divergence and everything falls apart and the community dies. Um, in the first case, you have something like the Constitutional Convention. In the second case, uh, the only way in my view to move forward, if you want to move forward, is an assurance proof of burn. So how that works is that you create a smart contract and you say, okay, uh, we're going to set a certain block height. Either this thing's going to trigger or it's going to refund all your money. And when you put your money into it, it's locked until that block height or until a certain threshold of the currency is reached. And then if it reaches the threshold, we destroy your money. And it gives you a cryptographic receipt that you can use to redeem on a completely new network. So then you at least know that 100% of people, if the threshold is reached in the new network, uh, uh, have agreed to the new social contract of the new network. And that might be a reasonable way forward actually to do uh, the migration to let's say proof of work, proof of stake hybrid with diffusing the difficulty bomb and maybe adding cool tech like Spectre or something like that. Yeah, so, so that could be a path forward, but I think it's too early in the process. Uh, but you do bring up a very valid point. The other thing is there's ambiguity in English. Lawyers love that. And uh, it would be really cool to see if somebody actually took the time to create a Loge bond version of the Declaration of Independence. So then we have like a not ambiguous way of expressing what we want that potentially computers could understand. But I mean, that's, that's the whole Bertrand Russell turtles all the way down uh, argument. And you, you just, you don't want to go down that road. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my view on it. Uh, it's too early to say, and we'll iterate our way to something good, I think. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, guys. Unfortunately, we're at the, at the end of our show, but, uh, but that was uh, very interesting to learn a bit about IOHK and learn more about Ethereum Classic. It's, I think it's, it's great that, that you guys are you know, working on this and see, 
trying to make or making this into a just serious project. Uh, I ha also have to declare, you know, personally, I, I, I sold all my ETC as, as soon as I was able to. <laughs> uh, so I should make that declaration. <laughs> Not necessarily because I think the fork was the right thing to do. It was purely that I, I felt like where the community ends up, the majority of the community is also where the value is going to be created. But uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what comes out of the ETC community. And, and I very much agree with some of the directions that you want to pursue. I think that's a very a good thing. Uh, and, and if those will be pursued in, in ETC, I think that would, be, that would be fantastic and great to see. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about the prospect of potentially taking ScoreX as a base and seeing if we could build a full uh, ETC node with that. That'd be really cool. Um, we'll probably have to do with ScoreX 2, which is coming out soon. But uh, thank you so much for having us on. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot to me. I've been a fan of your show for uh, since the beginning, basically. And you guys do some of the best work in the space. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. No, thanks so much, Damn it. That means a lot to hear this. So, uh, thanks, and yeah, hopefully we'll have you on uh, again at some point. I think you guys are doing a lot of interesting work, so I'm sure there will be lots of, uh, lots of occasions to make that happen. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, guys. My pleasure. Uh, and thanks so much for our listeners. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And of course, you can uh, subscribe to the show on any of the podcast applications or get the uh, videos on youtube.com slash Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.